So, here we continue with our discussion on routing which uh, we have been discussing over the last few lectures. So, if you, you recall we talked about area or grid routing where we are able to connect arbitrarily two points on a two dimensional grid like structure in the presence of obstacles. We also talked about global routing where once the blocks are placed and the so called channels and the routing regions are defined. So, for every net we were trying to find out the approximate sequence of routing regions that need to be traversed to complete that connection. Now, once this is done we take every routing region one at a time and try to complete the exact interconnection patterns to route that particular routing region it can be a channel or we shall see it can be another kind of a structure called a switch box. This step is called detailed routing and we shall be starting our discussion on this today. So, the topic of our lecture is detailed routing this is the first part of it. So, just exactly what I have said the scope of detailed routing is to determine the actual geometric layout for every interconnection net for the routing regions and typically the routing regions are handled one at a time. There are some obvious requirements two different nets they should not intersect on the same layer as otherwise you can understand there will be a short circuit between the two nets. So, if there are if there are two different nets they have to be laid out in a non disjoint in a disjoint fashion with non intersecting line segments. Okay. So, this problem as I had said is solved by considering one region at a, at a time in some particular order. So, the step of detailed routing will follow global routing and once this is done we can have some other steps like compaction which we shall be seeing later. Now, here there is a pictorial demonstration or illustration of what exactly we have talked about. So, after a set of blocks are placed, so the scenario may look like this. So, this rectangular boxes are the blocks and the small circles are the pins which need to be connected. So, global routing will give you an approximate route for example, this pin has to be connected to this pin this is the approximate route this is an approximate route, this is another approximate route like this. So, global routing will give you the sequence of routing regions that need to be followed, but once you are in the detailed routing step for each of these nets the exact connection the geometrical layout of the wires horizontal and vertical segments typically they have to be finalized or fixed this is the scope of detailed routing. So, once detailed routing is done you can say that well my layout in terms of routing is complete. So, now I can move on to the next step ok all right. So, this is just a quick recap. So, after global routing we consider the problem of detailed routing. Now, there are some important concepts to understand I shall try to explain these concepts with the help of some examples during global routing as I had said you recall our earlier lectures the entire routing region or space that is available on the chip that is typically partitioned into a set of rectangular routing regions we, we usually call them as R 1, R 2, R 3 the different regions where we can carry out the routing. Now, for every net we have to connect the corresponding terminals. Okay. So, for connecting the terminals we have to determine a sequence of sub regions that which are the regions that need to be traversed to connect the points corresponding to this net. Now, there is a concept of floating terminals this I shall be illustrating very shortly. It says that if a net is crossing the given boundary of a routing region then there can be something called floating terminals floating terminal means they are terminals 
whose exact location or position is not fixed as yet, but once the routing for that particular routing region is complete, this floating terminals will become fixed terminals, they, their exact coordinate or location will be finalized or fixed. So, this is what is meant. So, once the sub region is routed, the floating points will become fixed terminals. Now, I shall be explaining this very shortly, but before that let us talk about the routing regions. Now, depending on their geometric and uh, the relationship between the consecutive routing regions, the routing regions can be of two types, they are called channels or switch boxes. So, what is a channel? A channel is like a region where you have two parallel edges, they can be either horizontal or vertical and there are some pins which are located on the boundary of these parallel edges and our task is to interconnect some of these fixed points or terminals on these edges. Now, this region within the parallel boundaries is called a channel. Okay. So, we shall be looking at a number of channel routing techniques. Well, a more complex situation can arise in some cases where these terminals can exist in all four sides of a rectangular region. So, this is called a switch box. Switch box routing is typically more complex than channel routing and for a switch box this is just an example. So, I have shown some typical interconnections. Now, one thing you see that here I have shown the connections by different colors. Colors means these connections are being laid out on different metal layers typically, these are all done on metal layers. So, this blue and this uh, brown lines they are on two different metal layers and the junctions, junctions will mean there has to be a connection between the two layers, these junction between one horizontal and a vertical layer is called a via connection via or a some kind of contact connection between the points in the two layers. So, wherever a blue and a brown line will meet it implies that there is a via connection there okay, fine. So, these are channels and switch boxes. Okay. Now, let us come to this very important thing. Depending on the relative order of the routing regions, their order of routing can be determined in some particular way. Like you consider this kind of a situation, where there are three routing regions 1, 2 and 3 and these are the blocks. So, there will be pins along the boundaries. So, here what he says that the nets have to be routed in this order 1 and 2 first and 3 will be only after that. Why it is so? Let me try to explain it with the help of an example. Let us take the same example. Suppose, I have this rectangular region where these are the blocks, this is one block, this is one block, this is a block and this is a block. Now, for connection let us take a specific example, suppose I have a terminal called point 1 here, I have a terminal connecting point 1 here and also there is a 1 here. So, these are the three points we have to connect right. Similarly, let us say there is a point 2 here, there is a point 2 here, maybe there is a point 2 here also. There can be other points which do not cross like for example, there can be a 3 here and a here. So, I am just showing the scenario where you recall this where we have called as channel number 1 and this we have called as channel number 3 and this was channel number 2. So, we said that we have to first route channels 1 and 2 followed by channel 3. Now, let us see why you see suppose I 
consider channel 3 first. This is my channel 3, okay. this is my rectangular region, this entire thing is channel 3. Now, in channel 3, what is the definition of a channel? There will be two boundaries, parallel boundaries with the pins on some location on the two boundaries. Now, you see on this side, the position of this 1 and 2 are fixed, but what about this 1 and 2 here? So, means along this line it can be anywhere. So, we do not know exactly from where this 1 and 2 nets are coming. So, that is why along this boundary this 1 and 2 are said to be floating terminals, but suppose we route net 1 first. So, I am just giving an example, suppose we route it like this, this 1 2 vertical connection and 1 horizontal connection this is the first connection, then 3 will be connected. Let us say 3 is be connected like this, three is connected, then 2, let us say 2 will be connected like this. Right? Suppose this connection have been done. Now, once this is done, you look at net 1, net 1 we have already laid it out on a particular track. So, now net 1 will be coming here, this will be 1 and net 2 once it is laid out, net 2 will be coming horizontally along this point, this will be 2. Now, you see now this, this floating terminal 1 and 2 which are not defined, now these have become fixed, this is 1, this is 2. So, after 1 is complete, we can move to 3 and in 3 we can complete the routing in a similar way. Like for example, for connecting 1 from here, we can have a line here, we can have a line here, then we can have a line here. Similarly, for 2 we can have a say line here, line here and connection here. So, in this way we can complete the connection. And so, I think this example will tell you why we need to route 1 and 2 first and then 3. Okay? All right. So, this is for this particular scenario. This is a slicing placement topology, but suppose I have the second scenario which is a non sliceable floor plan or a so called wheel. So, here if you just check once you cannot route all the regions even in, a, in some particular sequence, because there may be terminals coming from some other directions. Say for example, I start with 1, this 1 may be having terminals coming from the left, coming from the right, some may be floating terminals and some terminals coming out here, floating terminals here. So, this will be like a switch box where terminals may be coming from all sides, not only vertical and horizontal, but on this side as well as this side. So, once you route 1, maybe you will find some order of the other. So, once these terminals are fixed, you can or these are fixed, you can route 2. Once 2 is fixed, you can route 3. Once 3 is fixed, you can route 4. But here, some of the routing regions may be considered to be as switch boxes and not simple channels this is what is the difference. Okay, some other routing considerations are as follows, one is related to the number of terminals, well most of the nets may be two terminal nets that connect only two points, but some of the nets clock and power are of course, obvious ones, but there can be other connections also which correspond to fan outs in some circuits. The output of the gate may be going to three different places. So, four points need to be connected together, okay. but clock and power are two examples where a large number of terminals may need to be connected. So, clock and power we shall be considering separately, because they require very special techniques, but otherwise the multi terminal nets are typically decomposed into two terminal nets and then they are routed one at a time. The second consideration is related to the width of the wires or the lines. Okay, some of the lines which carry higher currents like power and ground 
they may need to be of greater width, but the ones which are carrying signals they may be of less width no problem. Then via, via means you recall what I said via is a connection between two points and two adjacent layers. There has to be a some kind of hole with a metal in between that connects two points on two different layers. One thing we remember having a via in a layout in a fabrication process is a little difficult. So, less the number of wires the better. Okay. So, via again can be of two types one is the regular wires which are only between adjacent layers which may be easier and stacked means connections which may be passing through more than two layers which means we have to drill much further and make a connection. So, stacked wires are more difficult. Boundary types again the examples we have taken so far they have all straight straight line boundaries, but in general they may be arbitrary. Number of layers may be different may vary modern technology allows 5 or more layers and again regarding net types some of the nets are very critical like the power and ground lines clocks they need to be addressed separately and very carefully and there can be other nets which are not so critical like the signal nets. Well, just a very quick look this diagram shows you the typical CMOS fabrication of a of a n type transistor n MOS transistor and a p MOS transistor. So, you can recall we need to have a substrate where we have the gate and the source here gate and the source uh, drain and the source this is drain this is source and gate in between and gate has to be fabricated on top of a insulating layer. Similarly, for the p type transistor p MOS we, we create an n well within this we create two p type doped regions one is source other is the drain and again a gate in a similar way. Okay. So, the reason I am showing this is that when the transistors are interconnected like I am showing another picture very quickly this is the top view of two transistors one is an n type transistor one is a p type transistor their source and drain are connected by a metal and their gates are connected together by a polysilicon line. So, 3 D view it looks like this the gate is connected like this this is your source and drain of the of the n type transistor this is your source and drain of the p type transistor and this metal on layer m 1 connects the source and the drain just like I have shown here. Now, side view you can see that for connection you need to drill holes like this m 1 to take connection you have to have a connection like this from this drain you have to have a connection like this this needs to connect it to the source like this. So, there can be multiple such connection this is example of that via connection that I have said via a connection can exist between any pair of layers, but for routing we are more interested in metal to metal connections via connections between adjacent metal layers. Okay. And regarding routing models well most of uh, the routing techniques we shall talk about they use a grid based model where all the lines are considered to be of equal width and they are aligned to grid boundaries like this, but in general the lines can be arbitrarily placed and also arbitrarily shaped in terms of their width their heights and also need not be aligned to the grids. Okay. So, typically the power and ground nets follow this approach. And next when we look at multi layer routing means we have more than two layers available with us there are some models for that also like the examples that we said the blue line and the brown line we told that they are located on two different metal layers, but in general there can be more than two let us say three, three layer is quite popular. Okay. So, there you can have two broad approaches one is unreserved means that any net segment can be placed on any of the available layers 
The second one is that reserved layer where we have some restrictions like a reserved layer model for example, in a two layer case you can say age phi that means, horizontal connections on metal 1, vertical connections on metal 2 or vertical on metal 1, horizontal on metal 2. There are two layers you recall. So, you make a convention that all horizontal lines will be on the metal 1 which is below and all vertical lines will be on metal 2 which is above. Okay. In case of three layers m 1, m 2, m 3 you can have uh, some similar conventions like you can have either v h v vertical on m 1, horizontal on m 2, vertical on m 3 or the reverse horizontal, vertical, horizontal. So, usually most of the algorithms we shall talk about will be following some reserved layer model. Okay. These are some examples for a three layer routing. This shows h v h where you see horizontal is brown, vertical is blue this third horizontal is green. So, these are the three layers v h v is let us say blue is vertical, brown is horizontal, green is also vertical v h v, but you can have unreserved layer model where you can lay out an entire net on a same layer like blue. So, some segments are horizontal, some are vertical similarly this brown same layer green on the same layer. So, unreserved layer model means this. So, we can lay out both the horizontal and vertical segments of a net on the same layer. Now, see unreserved layer model may be little difficult to handle algorithmically, but has some obvious advantages. If you can lay a net entirely on the same layer, you will not need any wire connection for connecting to the other layer. Okay. So, there are some obvious advantages there, but again most of the algorithms they do some kind of a systematic transformation of the problem to a some kind of layout that uses some kind of reserved layer model that we shall see later. Okay. Channel routing is the most important kind of detail routing problem that we encounter, because as I said most of the VLSI chips ASICs that we fabricate or design today, they use this standard cell or semi custom design methodology. There the cells are arranged in rows like it looks like this, let us say I have one row of cells, there can be multiple cells of varying width, there is another row of cells, there is another row of cells like this. Now, one thing you can obviously see that the space that is there in between two consecutive rows, this is naturally a channel, it is a horizontal channel with pins are coming from top and here the pins are available here and you will have to connect them, you have to interconnect them. Similarly, there are pins here, there are pins here, you will have to interconnect them. So, there will be one channel C 1 in this case, there will be another channel C 2 in this case. So, the problem boils down specifically to the channel routing problem here, right. So, as I said that here in channel routing case, we carry out the interconnections within a rectangular region. Now, inside the channel the way we have defined it there are no obstructions, there are no blocks which you have placed inside the channels. right? So, this as I said most of the modern chips that we fabricate, there we have channels and that is why we use channel routers. The advantage is that the algorithms are very I means efficient in terms of their speed and quality and if you can adjust the width of the channels which in standard cell is possible, then 100 percent completion of routing is guaranteed, which is indeed a problem in general routing case. Say, I mean ensuring 100 percent completion of routing is one of the milestones that we usually select for the problem of routing. Okay. So, there are some terminologies that we use in channel routing track 
track is a horizontal row that is available for routing, trunk is a horizontal wire segment. So, so one net may be connected using multiple trunks, branch is a vertical wire segment that connects a trunk to a terminal and as I said via is a connection between two layers between a branch wire between a trunk wire. Okay. So, let us take an example. So, so, a channel routing problem is diagrammatically depicted like here. So, I have two horizontal lines with some numbers which indicate pins. This one will indicate the pins that have to be connected, the first net, two indicates the pins which have to be connected and three also have to be connected, zero means no connection. So, this can be represented by two lists top and bottom. 1, 2, 0, 2, 3 is the first list, 3, 3, 1, 1, 0 is the second list. So, if you are trying to write a program to implement any of the channel routing uh, I mean instances or algorithms, then the input problem you can represent it by two one dimensional arrays. And one possible solution is this. So, here you see these are the like you recall the definitions branch is a vertical wire segment and trunk and tracks are horizontal wire segments. So, these are the branches blue are the branches and this is uh, trunks, but you see track means the horizontal row and trunk is horizontal wire segment. So, what is track? Track here I am saying that there are three tracks available to us, but on the three tracks we have laid out three trunks. Track means the space that is available to us on the rows and trunks may be I am not using the whole space a part of it I am using to lay out a horizontal segment of a net okay, that is a trunk. Okay. So, this already I have mentioned. So, the task of the channel router will be to assign the horizontal segments of the net to tracks and assign vertical segments to connect the horizontal segments of the same net which, which may be placed in different tracks and the net terminals to sum up the horizontal net segments. The objective is to minimize the channel height and we shall see later there can be some horizontal and vertical constraints that must be met. So, let us just quickly see what are these constraints. The horizontal constraint says if the horizontal span of two nets overlap each other then the nets must be assigned to separate tracks. Like let us take an example, suppose I have a channel routing problem like this, I see the net 1 is here, here and here. So, the span of net 1 is from here to here. Okay. So, and net 2 is here, here and here, net 2 is here. So, there is an overlap between the ranges, it means you cannot lay out 1 and 2 on the same track you need minimum two tracks. So, the HCG or horizontal constant graph is a graph where the vertices indicate the net numbers and edges will exist if two nets they intersect somewhere in some column. Like for example, there is no edge between 4 and 5, let us see 5 is from here to here and 4 is from here to here, there is no intersection, they can be laid out on the same track if required. Okay. So, this is what is the horizontal constraint graph. Then we have something called a vertical constraint where it says if there is a column where the top terminal is i and the bottom terminal is j, it means net i must be assigned a track above j. This we shall see later through examples, but vertical constraint is like this. If again this is the channel routing problem, you see 1 is above 3, 0 is no connection, so ignore this, 2 is above 1, 2 is above 5, 1 is above 3. So, in this graph the edges will be having directions, 1 is above 3 there will be an arrow from 1 to 3, 2 is above 1 there is an arrow from 2 to 1 like this. Okay. This is a vertic vertical constraint graph and you can see this graph can also contain a cycle like 1 is on top of 4, 4 is on top of 2 somewhere here, 
and 2 is on top of 1 somewhere. Okay. 2 is on top of 1, 1 is on top of 4, 4 is on top of 2. So, there can be cycles in the VCG also. So, we shall see later in our next lectures that how we can use this HCG and VCG for channel routing problem to devise simple and efficient algorithms for channel routing. Thank you.